Father, we just thank you for time together and just um, Lord, being in your word is just always refreshing, Father. And may we be refreshed from your word tonight, Lord. May we be renewed. Uh, may we learn these lessons, Lord, these hard lessons that Judah had to learn. Um, may we take them to heart, the things that Babylon now we're going to see also had to learn. Lord, uh, may, may we learn from their mistakes, Lord, that we don't have to walk in the same ones. But as well, Lord, may we see the hope that you offer out as you always do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Jeremiah chapter 51. So we're on the last two chapters of Jeremiah tonight, and hopefully we get through both of them. Chapter 51 is the longest chapter of Jeremiah, so we're going to try to breeze through it um, pretty quickly. We are continuing in the judgment of Babylon. Of course, God used Babylon to judge, to discipline, to chastise Judah. Now, the thing when God does that, God, Babylon knew that. Babylon, God called Babylon for that. Um, but when, Bab, when Babylon was in Jerusalem and they were conquering Jerusalem, they went over the top. I mean, they started destroying. They were like a rapid dog going through that land. I mean, they ravaged the land. They had absolutely no mercy. And so what, what's going on now is, well, you know, basically what a person reaps, that's also what, or I'm sorry, what a person sows, that's what they're also going to reap. As they had no mercy on Judah, now we're going to see that the, there's going to be judgment that comes down upon Babylon, and you know what? It's not going to be full of mercy at all. You know, when God uses somebody or uses, like, say, this nation of Babylon to judge his kids, um, they had a choice. They had a choice. They could seek God, right? They could, they could go, okay, God, we are going to approach this, this land with fear and trepidation because, Lord, we are representing you as we're going in here. Lord, we are representing the work that you desire to do. Um, but you know what? When they did, when they went in, they didn't think that at all. And instead, they just went in, and like I say, they were like a rapid dog. Well, let's, let's read their judgment. Um, chapter 51, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it as we go through. Behold, I will raise up against Babylon, against those who dwell in Keb Kamai. This is a code word for Babylon. Okay, that's, um, it actually means the midst of those who rise up against me is kind of a derogatory word there. Um, I'm going to rise up a, a destroying wind, and I will send winnowers to Babylon who will winnow, winnow her and empty her land, for in the day of doom they shall be against all her all around, against her. The, let the archer bend his bow and lift himself up against her and in his armor. Do not spare my young men. Utterly destroy all her army. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans and those who, those who, um, and those thrust through in her streets. For Israel is not forsaking, nor Judah, by his God, the Lord of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. You know, God's, just, God's saying to them, to Babylon, I haven't forsaken. I haven't forsaken um, Israel. I didn't forsake I didn't forsake Judah just because I allowed you to go in and to chastise her. I didn't forsake her. Now, that was good news for, for Judah. Let me just pull up my notes here. And, um, and we'll get into this here. You know, when God says to Babylon, behold, I rise up against you. Whenever God has to say, I rise up against you, it's not going to be a good ending. You know, if, if God says, God says, you know, I am going to rise up to extend grace or I'm going to rise up to draw people to myself, that's great. That's great. But when he, when he gets to the point of where he says, I'm going to rise up against you, that means that somebody did not listen to a lot of warnings, a lot of warnings. You know, you think about it, too, when... 
Judah actually, God had Babylon rise up against Judah. How many warnings did Judah have to blow past? Um, how, how many times did they have to totally ignore God's word to get to that point of where God rose up against them? And, you know, there's lots. I mean, how many prophets? I mean, we were in the book of Jeremiah. Isaiah prophesied about it. Ezekiel, we're going to see prophesied. We got the 12 minor prophets after this. We're going to see most of them are going to prophesy about, the, about some of the same things. So prophet after prophet, God sending and saying, I am going to rise up against you if you don't take the warnings. And you know what? Judah never did. And now here's Babylon. And you know God chose Babylon to judge Judah. And God's saying now to Babylon, I'm going to rise up against you. In verse, verse 2 through 5, here God ends with and says, Israel's not forsaken, nor Judah. By his God, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the angel armies. That's what hosts are. Though their land is filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. God never forsakes his children. Never. Now, when Babylon went on their rampage, they acted like God had forsaken them. That's the impression that they gave. It is a bad thing when people, those who are to represent God, Babylon was representing, you know, God's judgment, right? When they use that authority to misrepresent him. It's a very bad thing. You know, God calls us, as, as his children, God calls us to a higher standard. He holds us to a higher standard than he does to the other people. And that's just the way of it. Judah was called to a higher standard than other nations, much higher. Babylon, in turn, was called to a higher standard. But they squandered it. Both nations did. Both did. Judah filled the land with sin. And you think about that. You think about who Judah was and what she was supposed to represent. And I mean, of course, Israel too. But, you know, think about that. Judah was to represent God and be a, a vehicle to be able to see who God is and to know what God's ways are to the entire world. And so instead of filling the land, right, with the knowledge of God and his ways, the, the knowledge of his ways, they filled the land with sin. Again, again, this is where free will becomes so essential to just recognize God didn't have a plan B. You know, God didn't say, well, okay, well, if Israel's not going to fill the world with the knowledge of me, if Israel's not going to represent me properly, well, then I'll just go to plan B. God didn't have a plan B. His plan was Israel. And Israel chose to misrepresent him. And not only did Judah, well, Judah, Israel, okay, Judah, Israel was in the north, Judah was in the south. Um, I swap the names back and forth oftentimes. Um, but not only did Judah choose to not represent him correctly, um, they suffered for it. There's no doubt about it. No doubt. But so did the whole entire world. The whole world suffered. There was no plan B to get his ways out into other lands. Israel was called to be priests to the world. Now, fast forward that to today, okay, where we are today. God doesn't have a plan B for the world today. He's given the church the job to represent him to nations, to people, all peoples, everywhere. What happens? What happens if God's children act as if the church is something that I do rather than what I am? What happens? What, what happens when God's kids like, get this attitude that I'm just going to do a Sunday gig type of thing, and then I'm going to live a totally different other way through the week? What, what happens? What's the result of that? What happens when God's children say, well, I'm just going to follow when it's convenient, but when it gets too tough? You, God does not have a plan B for our region. He doesn't. God does not have a plan B for your workplace. God doesn't have a plan B for your friends or for your family. He, he doesn't. I mean, we get this, right? 
I mean, God is absolutely sovereign. There's no doubt about it. But he has chosen us to represent him. Judah never took that charge seriously. And instead, they looked the same. Other nations would look on Judah and they go, well, you're the same as us. I mean, you do the same thing. There's very little difference between us and you. And you know what the world is telling us today? That when they know, you know, it was 85% of the people um, claim to have um, a follower of Jesus in their life. They, they know of a follower of Jesus, but less, it was, it's only a very small percentage that actually say there's a difference between their lives and the, and, and their, and the follower of Jesus' life. It's a shame. So with Judah, they looked very little, very little different than the nations around them, very little different. They forsook God, but God never forsook them. And that's what he's saying right there. He said, I've never forsaken you. Verse 6, flee from the midst of Babylon, and everyone save his own life. Don't, do not be cut off um, for her in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her. Babylon was a, gold, a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, therefore the nations are deranged. Babylon has suddenly fallen and has been destroyed. Wail for her. Take up the balm of her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. It's like this is all some sarcastic speaking going on in here. Okay, he's a, you know take up some balm that, she, that um, for for her pain that perhaps she might be healed. Verse nine says, "We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and and let us go, everyone to her own country, for her judgment reaches to the heavens and is lifted up to the sky." You know, the idea here of healing by taking some balm and rubbing it on her wounds, it's not going to happen when her judgment reaches to the skies. When judgment reaches to the skies, it's just not good. Psalm 36, it says, your mercy is in the heavens or reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. But here it is. Here it is. Her judgment reaches to the skies. And, you know, that's what Babylon settled for. They could have settled for mercy. They, they could have. They could have settled for faithfulness. They, they could have chose that, but instead they settled for judgment because the immediate satisfaction of ignoring God's ways and, 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 and what God had called them to, that, that's what they chose rather than looking forward and just making the hard choice the hard choice in the present. And so what that looked like for Babylon is when they went into Jerusalem to conquer Jerusalem, to conquer Judah, they went in like people that were just drunk on blood, lusting for violence. And so, yeah, they caved into that. And you know what? Now judgment is reaching to the sky, to the heavens, where if they would have gone in and say, okay, God's called us to do this, do this job, but we are his, these are his people, and we're going to handle it with care. Then they would have seen mercy reaching to the heavens. That's the choice they made. That's the choice. Verse 10. The Lord has revealed our righteousness. Come and let us declare in Zion the work of the Lord our God. And that's the remnant of Judah saying that. Verse 11, make the arrows bright, gather the shields. The Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes, for his plan is against Babylon to destroy it, because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance, the vengeance for his temple. And so here the Medes are being called on, and they're going to come and conquer um, the Babylonians. And notice it's the vengeance of the Lord and the vengeance for his temple. They went in and they totally destroyed the temple. We'll see that in the next chapter. Verse 12, set up the standard on the walls of Babylon. Make the guard strong. Set up the watchman. Prepare the ambush for the Lord has both devised and done what he has spoke against what he, what he spoke against the, the inhabitants of Babylon what he spoke against the inhabitants of Babylon. Yeah. Oh, you who dwell by many waters, ab abundant in treasures, your end has come, the measures of your covetousness. 
The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself, surely I will fill you with men as with locusts, and they shall lift up a shout against you. So this is just the whole judgment that's going to come down upon Babylon of the armies coming in of, of the Medes. But notice, notice that on, on um, their abundant treasures and the measure of their covetousness. It's all come to a head. Babylon was extremely, extremely wealthy. I mean, just um, an immense amount of gold. But you know, when God moves, when God is, well, here it's going to be moving in judgment. Um, when he moves, nothing is going to stop him. And he, he moves in his time and his time only. If you lived in Babylon during the time of Jeremiah writing this, if, if you were there, you would look at the city and you would go, how? How are armies going to get in here? I mean, how is this place really, I mean, this, really this place is going to be destroyed? No one could see how Babylon could ever be destroyed. I mean, it was the foremost city in the world. It was the most powerful. It was within the most powerful nation of the world. Who could possibly rise up against it? The Medes? I mean, when Jeremiah said, the Medes, if a Babylonian saw this, they would laugh. Go like, those people who we've conquered over and over again? But with God... God could bring down an entire nation with just a few. God doesn't need armies of other lands to do it. You know, and, and I think about today, I mean, God could still bring down nations as he pleased. But I wonder, I, I wonder, you know, like the Medes are just this small, they were, they were tribes of people that were gathered together. Yes, they had a king, you know, no doubt about it. But again, the Babylonians conquered them. And really, they were just a small group of people. And yet, they're going to be the ones that tear down the Babylonians. And it makes me wonder. It's God's raising them up for this reason. But I wonder, what could God do with a people, like in our time, in our land, who are just hungry to see his work done in a land. I wonder what God would do and what God will do in, in, in our region when we're just offering ourselves up to him to be lights in this land. Just God, use us. Use us. You said, you know, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, so God, just use me. And, and I wonder what would happen when we just set our hearts towards that thing. You see, God could overturn the Babylonians with an obscure people. He can overturn our region with an obscure people as well. They're just called by his name. And, you know, I believe he wants to do it. The question is, you know, do we want to see him do it? Verse 15. He has spoken, or, or I'm sorry, he has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens by his understanding. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightnings for the rain. He brings the wind, the wind out of his treasuries. Just a reminder of who God is. This is who he is. He he has control of absolutely anything and he and everything, and he will do as he wills. Verse 17, everyone who is dull hearted without knowledge, even the metalsmith is put to shame by his carved images for his molded image is falsehood and there is no breath in them. They are futile, the work of errors. In the time of their punishment, they shall perish. And so God's speaking to the gods here that the, that the people worship here, the, the people who are making them, the metalsmiths and so forth, and, and even those who were making them. When people were worshiping these idols, you know, they could say, well, you know, this God is just like that God, and they could play that whole game until God, the real God, comes to judge. And when God comes to judge, he's the one that remains. All these other ones are seen for what they are, and they're just errors. And that's just the way of it. Verse 19, the portion of Jacob, that's another name for God, the portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the maker of all things, and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts, so the God of angel armies, is his name or Yahweh of angels' armies. 
Yahweh is the maker of all things. All other gods are not. People make other gods. God makes people. You know, God's not formed by people. God's not formed by the concepts that people have of them. God forms people and God has revealed himself. And if he has not revealed himself, he would not be known. The word of God is his self-revelation of himself. That's what he does throughout his word. And that's why we go through the Bible the way that we go through it. Why? Because we want his full revelation that he has. Verse 20, you are my battle axe and weapons of war, for with you I will break the nation in pieces. With you I will destroy kingdoms. With you I will break in pieces the horse and the rider. With you I will break in pieces the chariot and its rider. With you I will break in pieces man and women. With, with you I will break in pieces young and old. With you I will break in pieces the young man and the maiden. With you I will break in pieces the shepherd and his flock. With you I will break in pieces the farmer and his yoke of oxen. With you I will break in pieces govern and rulers. And I think we get the idea there. God's making that very clear. And I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea for all the evil that they have done in Zion in your sight, says the Lord. So all the evil that was done in Zion or in Jerusalem, God says, I'm going to repay them for them. You know, again, going back to the laws of sowing and reaping. Spiritual laws, but they're universal laws as, as well. What you sow, you're also going to reap. They could have been merciful in their conquering of Judah. They chose not to be. What a person sows, that's what they're also going to reap. The scripture tells us if we sow to the flesh, from that we are going to reap corruption, destruction. But if we sow to the spirit, we're going to reap everlasting life. But the scripture doesn't end there. It goes on to say, therefore, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we don't give up. In due season. That means that it's going to be tough when you're consistently doing the right thing. And God knows that. That's why God gives that an encouragement to us. Don't grow weary while doing good. God knows it's going to be hard sometimes to consistently do good or to consistently do the right thing. Sometimes, sometimes it's going to seem like it would be easier if I just squint a little bit here, you know, or, or I try to do good and it backfires in my face. God knows that that's going to happen at times. God knows that it's going to be hard to be consistent in a ministry that doesn't seem to be producing much fruit. And yet his words are very clear. Don't give up. You keep doing what's right. Keep doing what's good. And the harvest is coming. And it is coming. Amen. We just need to consistently be doing what's good and what's right. Consistently. Um, Verse 25, Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, who destroys the earth, says the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you down from the rocks, and make you a burnt mountain. They shall not take from you a stone for a corner, nor a stone for the foundation, but you shall be desolate forever, says the Lord. That's quite a crazy statement for the city that was so vast. They're not even going to take a stone from you. Verse 27, set up a banner in the land, blow the trumpet among the nations, prepare the nations against her, call the kingdoms together against her, Arat, Mini, Ashkenaz, appoint a general up against her, cause the horses to come up like, like the bristling locusts, prepare against her the nations who are the kings of the Medes, its governors and its rulers, and the land of his dominion. And the land will tremble in sorrow, and every purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon to make the land of Babylon a desolation without inhabitant. The mighty men of Babylon have ceased fighting. They have remained in, in their strongholds. Their might has failed. They have become like women. They have burned down their dwelling places. The bars of her gate are broken. One runner will run to meet another, and one messenger will run to meet another to show the king of Babylon that a city is taken on all sides. 
So the imagery here, of course, is of the walls just being penetrated. Um, the runners are sent to, you know, go tell other parts of the city that we need reinforcements over here. One runner goes out. He's met by another runner who's also seeking reinforcements. In other words, the whole entire city is taken. They're, they're surrounded or being taken on every single side. Verse 32, the passages are blocked. The reeds they have burned with fire, and the men of war are terrified. And that just describes on how the Medes kind of destroyed um, Babylon, how they made their way in. The reeds they've burned with, with fire. The reeds would be those along the Euphrates rivers. See, the Euphrates river ran straight down the center of Babylon. Cyrus, Cyrus the Mede went in and he diverted the Euphrates river up north of Babylon. He made these, these canals around Babylon. And so this main river, so the Euphrates that went through the city, well, they made it dry up. And so here was the gate. The gate was left open through the river, and the Medes came right in there, and you know, they took over instantly. We'll see that when we get to Daniel. Verse 33. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor when it's time to thresh her. Yet a little while and the time of her harvest will come. Just another metaphor of her destruction. Verse 34, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has devoured me. He has crushed me. He has made me an empty vessel. He has swallowed me up like a monster. He has filled his stomach with my delicacies. He has spit me out. Let the violence done to me and my flesh be upon Babylon, the inhabitant of Zion will say, and my blood be upon the inhabitants of the Chaldean, Jerusalem will say. So Judah speaking there. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will plead your case and I'll take vengeance for you. I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. Babylon shall become a heap, a dwelling place for jackals, an astonishment and a hissing without an inhabitant. They shall roar together like the lions and they shall growl like lion whelps. In their excitement, I will prepare their feasts. I will make them drunk that they may rejoice in this sleep and sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake, says the Lord. I will bring them down like lambs to a slaughter, like rams with male goats. Oh, how Shishak is taking another word for Babylon, Shishak. And oh, how the praise of the whole earth is seized, how Babylon has become a desolation among the nations. A sea has come up over Babylon. She is covered with a multiple or multitude of its waves. Her cities are a desolation, a dry heap, a wilderness, a land where no one dwells through which no son of man passes. I will punish Baal in Babylon and will bring out his mouth um, out of his mouth what he has swallowed, and the nations shall not stream to him anymore. Yes, the wall of Babylon shall fall. Um, so, you know, these are quite a, a lot of statements going on about the destruction of Babylon here. But, you know, some incredible statements about the walls of Babylon coming down. Again, if you were in Babylon in this day, you could not see how this was going to be possible. I mean, Babylon was the center of everything. I mean, it was the commerce center. It had extreme wealth. Trade routes all went through her. Her walls, the walls of Babylon, they thought to be eternal. And these things were massive, massive. They were one of the wonders of the ancient world, according, according to Herodotus. The walls, he describes the walls. He says they were over 56 miles long around Babylon. They were 80 feet wide, 80 feet wide. The, some of the walls were up to 320 foot high. So I mean, these things are massive. I mean, you look at these, these, again, one of the wonders of the ancient world. I mean, it was, just, it was just a massive fortified city. You would look at it and go, well, what could possibly ever break through these walls? Well, the Medes didn't have to. They went right through the Euphrates River, where the Euphrates River went through the walls, right through that gate, and, and um, destroyed it from within. The Medes dismantled Babylon, and it took, they, they had over 200,000 slaves working on it every day for a year just to break down the walls. But that's what the Medes did. They utterly destroyed it. Verse 45. My people, 
go out of the midst of her and let everyone deliver himself from the fierce anger of the Lord. Second time God calls his people to come out of her. It's interesting that Judah would make Babylon, they would make it their home. When we see the call for Israel, for Judah to go back into the land, you could read about it in Ezra. Uh, the amazing thing about it was not a whole lot of, of Israelites went back. I mean, some did, there's no doubt about it, but there were a lot that stayed. There would be waves coming back into the land. Nehemiah happened to be on one of those waves towards the, the end. He took the last wave back, but a lot of them just stayed in Babylon. And here God saying to them, he's like, there's coming a point in time where you got to get out of Babylon. And this same call is going to be given in Revelation where we'll see the same kind of wording when God is talking about the economic Babylon. So some of this stuff is yet to be fulfilled. Verse 46, so get out of her, lest your heart faint, lest you fear with a rumor that it will be heard in the land, a rumor that will come one year, and after that in another year, a rumor will come and violence in the land, ruler against ruler. Therefore, behold, behold, the lands, uh, the days are coming that I will bring judgment on the carved images of Babylon. Her whole land shall be ashamed, and all her slain shall fall in her midst, and the heavens and the earth and all that is in them shall sing joyously over Babylon, for the plunderers shall come to her from the, from the north, says the Lord. As Babylon has caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon the slain of the earth shall fall. You who have escaped the sword, get away. Don't stand still. Remember the Lord from afar and let Jerusalem come to your mind. Remember Jerusalem here. We are ashamed because we have heard, we have heard reproach. Shame has covered our face for strangers have come into the sanctuaries of the Lord's house. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring judgment on her carved images and throughout her land all the wounded shall groan. Though Babylon were to mount up to heaven, though she were to fortify the height of her strength, yet from me plunderers would come to her, says the Lord. So in other words, God's saying, it doesn't matter how high your walls are. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. None of that is going to stop the destruction when I send it. That's what God's saying. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how strong a nation is. When God says, I'm going to judge you, that's when he's going to judge them. And that's what's going on with Babylon right there. Now, we get the whole imagery there of her destructions. The Babylonians trampled on Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. Um, and, you know, in reality, what was going through the Babylonians' minds is, well, we destroyed their God. We destroyed God. And, and you know what? That, or we defeated God is what I should say there. Um, that was willfully forgetting God because of the success that Babylon was experiencing. Willfully, willfully forgetting God. Willfully, see, in Daniel, Daniel is called into the throne room of Babylon um, when the Medes are getting ready to be taken over. When we get to Daniel, we'll see this. Daniel rebukes the king at the time, Belshazzar, saying, you have not humbled your heart like Nebuchadnezzar did, even though you knew what happened to him. And he said, he goes on and he says, you haven't glorified God who holds your breath and owns your ways. In other words, what Daniel's saying to, to um, Belshazzar right before the Medes were going to take over, he says, you willfully forgot God, and you willfully chose not to give God the time of day. You had, your, you had your father or your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, you had all his records. You know how he humbled himself. You know how his sanity was taken away from him. You saw how he came into repentance and the letters that he wrote out to the entire world. They had knowledge of God. He said, but you didn't give him the time of day. Willfully forgot. Willfully chose not to glorify him. Verse 54, 
The sound of a cry comes from Babylon and great destruction from the land of the Chaldeans because the Lord is plundering Babylon and silencing her loud voice. Though her waves roar like great waters and the noise of their voice is uttered because the plunderer comes against her, against Babylon, and her mighty men are taken. Every one of their bows is broken for the Lord is the God of recompense. He shall surely repay. And I will make drunk her princes and wise men, her governors, her deputies, and her mighty men. And they shall sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake, says the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the broad walls of Babylon shall be utterly broken and her high gates shall be burned with fire. And the people will labor in vain and the nations because of her fire, they shall be weary. Thus the prophecies of Babylon and its destruction. Um, this prophecy, by the way, was given 60 years, 60 years before this would happen. And when it did happen, they would see every single word of it come true, come to pass. The word of Jeremiah, the prophet, commanded Sarah, Sarah the son of Neriah, the son of me, or Ma. Masiah, when he went to Zedekiah, the king of Judah, to Babylon in the fourth year of his reign, and Sarahiah was the quartermaster. Now, Sarahiah is the, um, the brother of Baruch, who earlier we met Baruch, he wrote down the words of Jeremiah. Okay, so he would be given this this prophecy, we're going to see in a few minutes, he's going to be given very specific instructions of what to do with it. He would be given it, and then he would have to hold on to it for seven years until the walls of Jerusalem were breached. Look at verse 60. So Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that would come upon Babylon, all these words that were written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sarahiah, when you arrive in Babylon and see it and read these words, then you shall say, O Lord, you have spoken against this place to cut it off so that none shall remain in it, neither beast nor, nor, or, or, nor man, but it shall be desolate forever. Now it shall be when you have finished reading this book that you shall tie a stone to it and throw it out into the Euphrates, and you shall say, thus Babylon shall sink and not rise from the catastrophe that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Um, thus far are the words of Jeremiah. <laughs> Amazing. You know, here Zara, uh, Sarahiah is going to have the words of Jeremiah. He's going to go into Babylon when he makes his way into Babylon from captivity or whatever. Um, he's going to give the word, and he's going to Look at this flourishing city, absolutely hustle, bustle, just absolutely flourishing in, in every respect and say, not one inhabitant is going to be left in here. Um, it would have been just an amazing scene because everybody would have looked at him like, you're absolutely crazy, crazy. But imagine what it would be like to be Sarah Aya at this point in time as the Babylonians were going to come and surround Jerusalem. See, I mean, he's going to have to wait seven years, but then what's going to happen is the Babylonians are going to surround Jerusalem. And he's going to see a lot of stuff go down, but he has a commission from God. And the one thing in the midst of all, I mean, I can imagine the fear of seeing the armies come in. I can imagine the fear of just, you know, seeing like their enemies coming upon them and all the things that go on with, with war. But Sarahiah had this one thing, this, this, this hope. God gave his word to me. And in his word, there's a commission for me to stand in Babylon and to speak these things. And so no matter what would come to pass around Sarahiah, he knows this much. My life is going to be spared. I am going to find myself in Babylon one day. And I, it must have been an amazing um, comfort in the midst of a, a lot of calamity. Chapter 52, so we'll finish up with this last chapter. This is the account of the fall of Jerusalem. Oh, by the way, chapter 52 is not in chronological order. A lot of Jeremiah is not in chronological order, right? It's doesn't, it jumps all around. Um, it's, 
the important aspect to Jeremiah was not chronological, chronological, like how the order of the events, but the order of the concepts. That's what's important. And so here we saw Babylon coming to an end, and now we go back and we look at how Jerusalem came to an end. So verse 1. Zedekiah was 21 years when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. So he was the last king of Judah. Okay, his mother's name was um, Hamutel, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. He also did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. Well, let's just stop right there. He had done evil in the sight of the Lord evil in the sight of the Lord. This is the way that he would be memorialized. He did evil in the sight of God. You look at that, you go, what a waste of life. 21. 21, he's going to reign for 11 years. And the only thing that God could say about his life when it was all said and done is he did evil in my sight. And here at 21, when he becomes king, you've got to think about it. He thinks that he's on top of his game at that point in time, right? I am the king of a nation. I mean, there's not many people that are kings of a nation. It's kind of a small club. He starts reigning at 21, and immediately the pressure comes upon him. Who am I going to fear? Am I going to fear God, or am I going to fear man? Zedekiah would choose to fear man because the rewards of that would be immediate. The rewards of fearing God, well, it's like sowing and reaping, right? It takes time to see that in one's life. You know, you think about Zedekiah here. He, it's not like he didn't have good examples in his life. His father was Josiah. And even though, you know, he was young when his father died, he would have had access to all that his father stood for. He would have been able to read, and I'm sure he heard about all the things that his father did and the way that revival was going on during his land and the way that he led the nation to follow God wholeheartedly or the way that he did, Josiah did himself. He would have read of the conquests of Josiah. He could have read of his two brothers before him who also sat on the throne but chose to do wickedly. He, would have, he could have looked at them and said, well, look what happened to them. You know, it's not like he didn't find godly counsel. There would be godly counsel in Jerusalem. It's just that he chose to do his own thing, his own way. And when it was all said and done, God looks at his life and says, labels him as one who did wicked in my sight. It's crazy. Because... You know, to, to me, I, I look at that, I go, he could have chose another way. He could have chose to be like David and sought, the God, sought God with all his heart. He could have chose that. And I wonder what, would have, what the end would have been if he, if he did chose that, what the story would have turned out to be. Um, but anyway, he chose to do wicked. Verse 3. For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah till he finally cast them out of his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Then it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and his army came against Jerusalem and camped against it, and they built a siege wall against it all around. And so the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. By the fourth month, on the ninth month, uh, or the ninth day of the month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then the city wall was broken through, and all the men of war fled and went out of the city by night by the way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans were near the city all around, and they all went out by the plain. And so they just wanted to get out. They wanted to escape the king's armies and all of that, along with the kings. Um, and so the city is in a state of famine, and the people are so weak within the city that the walls are broken through. There's not a whole lot of resistance. Those who are left of the king's armies are now trying to escape another way. Um, just nasty, nasty scene. You know, in Babylon, 
at this point in time, Zedekiah the king here, he, here he had his, his nephew was there. Nebuchadnezzar already took him to Babylon. There were two waves of exiles that already went to Babylon. Daniel was in that first exile. Again, we're going to meet Daniel in a few months after we make our way through um, Ezekiel. But Daniel was in that first wave of exiles. Ezekiel was in the second wave of exiles. And so a lot of the intellectuals, a lot of the craftsmen, um, any of the nobles, a lot of them were taken away in those, in those waves to Babylon already. And so now here, this is the third one, and Zedekiah is among this third wave, and you know, a lot of them are just going to be destroyed. A lot of them. Verse 7, so the city wall was broken through, verse 8, right? And the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king. They overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him. And so they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Ribah in the land of Hamath and pronounced judgment on him. And the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and killed all the princes of Judah in Ribah in Riblah. And he also put the eyes, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and the king of Babylon bound him in bronze fetters and took him to Babylon and put him in prison until the day of his death. Probably wasn't expecting that when he began his reign. And he chose the fear of man over the fear of God. Probably didn't expect that. But this was his end, nevertheless. You know, here he saw the last thing he sees with his eyes is his sons killed before him, and then his eyes are taken out. You know, so here's a man who's gone before us who would say to us, if I could have done it over, this is what I would have chosen. I would have chosen to fear God first and not chosen the fear of man. If I could have done it over, I would have walked in the ways of, the, of God, even though they're hard at first, the fruit that comes later would be, would be wonderful. But the fruit that comes from just fulfilling the flesh, yes, there's that short burst, that instant burst of, of pleasure, but the results of it are nothing but blindness and bondage. Now in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, which was the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, oh, we better book here. Okay. The captain of the guard who served the kings of Babylon came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, all the houses of, Jer of Jerusalem. Um, that is, all the houses of the great he burned with fire. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were, the, uh, who, uh, who were with the captain of the guard broke down all the walls of Jerusalem all around. Nebuzaran, the captain of the guard, carried away captives, some of the poor people, the rest of the people who remained in the city, the defectors who had deserted to the king of Babylon, and the rest of the craftsmen. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left some of the poor in the land as vine dressers and farmers. And so it's just kind of giving a picture of, of who he took out of the city. Um, you know, we're going to see, we're going to look at it next week. We're going to see the destruction of the temple. We're going to see that what's left of the city is going to be, really, there's not going to be anything. He goes through. I mean, it was just like it says here. He burned the house of the Lord. He burns everything within the city. He tears down the walls of Jerusalem, just utterly and totally destroys it. There's nothing left. They're making Jerusalem uninhabitable. They're making Jerusalem an example to all the other nations of never betraying Babylon. This is what you don't want to do as a city. You don't betray Babylon. Um, and that was going to be their example. They had no mercy for Judah. And when all is said and done, God is going to look at Babylon and say, I'm not going to have mercy on you because you chose to not have mercy on my people when I was asking you to um, have mercy on them. And so you know what? When it all comes down to it, 
you know, applying that to our own lives. God has us interact with all kinds of people in our lives. God will have us correct people. God will have us encourage one another. Um, you know, and it's a great thing. But when it's all said and done, I want to be a person that is more gracious than I am more condemning. And when it comes down to being gracious or just, and I don't know which way God is asking me to go, I always want to err on the side of grace because God can always fix that. But the other side, that's where we can misrepresent him. Well, let's stop right there. And next week, we'll finish out Jeremiah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for the time together. And, um, you know, just looking over um, the destruction of Babylon and, again, the, the destruction uh, of Judah. And, God, we want to be a people, not like Zedekiah was, um, Lord, that feared man. And we're just concerned about, you know, his peers and about the powers that he had and all that. Lord, we want to have our eyes fixed on you. We want to have our eyes, Lord, seeing much further down the road than just the temporal. We want to be able to, um, Lord, see the eternal and have that affect our lives right now. Lord God, um, that's, that's what we want to be, Lord. We want to do the work that you have for us to do in this land and not lose sight of it. So God, refresh us, renew us by these words, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.